she would be very proud of how I was elevated to be the first Canadian to serve as Grand President. One definition of happiness is to love what you do and do what you love. I believe we will discover that about our guests today. We are honored to have as our guests, women who have all excelled in the arts. Diane Kuchilis, chef extraordinaire and author in the culinary arts. Katerina Merticus in the visual arts. Yeah. Eleni Canelos in the musical arts and Marina Van Vakas in the visual and literary arts. Welcome and thank you for being part of our International Women's Day celebration. Assisting today are Grand Vice President Kathy Bazookas, Grand Secretary Georgette Bulajeris, Grand Treasurer Marianthi Trapidi, and our Executive Director, Elena Saviolakis. If the audience has any questions, please post them in the question and answer section. And if time permits, our guests will answer your questions at the end of our presentation. So let us begin. The biographies of our speakers today are very extensive and very impressive. And I could spend the entire time telling you about our guests in my words but I am quite confident that you would rather hear from them. Diane Kochilis is a renowned author of 18 books, host and creator of My Greek Table, and a foremost authority on Greek and Mediterranean cuisine. She also runs the glorious Greek kitchen on Ikaria each spring and fall. So I hope my sisters are listening because this could be a destination for us when we can once again travel. Diane, could you tell us about your journey and who inspired you to embark on this journey? Uh, sure, thank you first of all for having me. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the, definitely the product of a Greek American uh, upbringing, uh, the product of Greek parochial schools uh, for the first eight years of my life, full-time Greek school, not just after-school Greek school. Um, and then I was thrown into New York City public schools um, by my own um, volition. And that was quite, quite an experience, but anyway, um, I come from, my family comes from the island of Ikaria. And that is a very uh, unusual place in that um, it's renowned for many reasons. Uh, the longevity of its uh, inhabitants, it's a blue zone. If you know what that is, it's the handful of places around the world where the longevity statistics are very uh, off the charts high. But it's also a place where the women are very strong. Um, in fact, the, the men have the dowry on the island of Ikaria, not the women. So I grew up uh, in a family where the, we're three sisters and I'm the youngest of, of three sisters. And uh, my mom was widowed at an early age. She was in her late fifties. So she had one child left to raise and that was me. And I had you know, a living example of what it means to be totally tossed to the wind and survive and do a good job of it and raise, you know, what I hope is a good kid, me. <laughs> and just, you know, she was a quiet person and not somebody with a career. She was forced to go back to work when, when my father passed away. But now as an adult, you know, with my own children, you know, now they're, they're also adults. Um, you know, what I realized was that her example of just quiet fortitude was the, the, most, the deepest gift, the most profound gift I, I, I had in my life. Um, she never discouraged me. She never told me I couldn't do anything. I was, you know, I was always a very willful, obnoxious, bratty child. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, brazen, she used to call me brazen. And, uh, but she also encouraged me, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. So we were much less parented than, 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 than our own children. So for, you know, when I was a young woman, 
trying to figure out what I was going to do, I upped and left for Greece in my early 20s. I'd finished school and I left for Greece. And I kind of started writing about food when I was in Greece. I wrote for the Athenian magazine and then came back to New York. Uh, I got married here, came back to New York. Um, and one thing led to another, but I published a, a book called The Food and Wine of Greece in 1990. Um, I know, was that 1990? It was 1990, yeah. And I was 30. And, you know, that kind of set me on this path um, of exploring, using food as a tool to explore Greece, to explore the culture that I was from. Uh, I, you know, I lived here on and off in my, in my late 20s. And then I, li I visited also as a child and a young, a young adult um, every summer. But food, you know, for all, for all the cliches, you know, a woman in the kitchen kind of cliche, food is really a fascinating aspect of any culture. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a living example of, of every single layer of culture. And Greece is so, you know, as we all know, is so rich, whether one looks at it from a religious point of view or from a historical point of view or from a geographical point of view, the food, that's on the table in Greece is a mirror of this country's complex history. So that has always kept me very um, fascinated by, by this place. And I've been in Greece full time. I've lived here, I raised my kids here. Um, I've been here, um, I've been here 30 years, a little bit less than 30 years. Um, always going back and forth to the States, but I always had this dream. I worked as a journalist here. Um, I worked for Tanea. So all that good, you know, all those, all those horrible hours in Greek school uh, served me well because I learned how to read and write and, you know, could actually communicate uh, and wrote for Tanea here for 20 years, which is what, at the time it was the biggest newspaper. Um, but I always, and then I did a TV show here, but then I always had this dream of doing a TV show in the States. And I've always been, you know, kind of a self-appointed um, food ambassador and have always, I mean, that was kind of my life's mission to share the, the culture of Greece through its food with, with Americans. And I, it, it wasn't something I set out to do. I have a journalism and French literature degree and never thought really about food. My dad was a professional cook. Um, my mom wasn't, she was a terrible cook, very skinny until the day she died. and. He ate like a bird, but um, you know, somehow you come full circle and you in some weird way become your parents and some interpretations. So that's kind of what happened. And I, I started to um, put together this show a few years ago and one thing led to another and we, we pulled it off. We uh, got our first season off and running and now we're working on our fourth season. And it's just been an incredible, journey um, of sharing and teamwork and um, and working with Greek and non-Greek crew members. And I can have some funny stories about that, but I don't want to, I'm, I'm being a hog. So I'll let every, every, somebody else take the, the microphone. <laughs> well, it's very interesting and it, it's interesting how um, little things along the way in your life, you know, all come together to a perfect opportunity and so I think one thing that I really enjoyed about your show is not only the food and the customs but it's also a little bit of the history of the area um, and so it's very very interesting and you know it has enticed me to travel to certain areas etc and try different things or try you know everybody's got a baklava recipe or everybody's got a biryama recipe but in different parts of Greece they're made in different ways so um, it, it's a wonderful journey that you're taking. And I know that uh, you, I'm sure, will be an inspiration to many who come following you. And I want you to know that I, too, am the youngest of three sisters. So we have a connection. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Um, anyone who has been to my home knows that I love Katerina Mertikas' artwork. And you can even see a couple in the background. Her pieces are bright, lively, cheerful, and filled with happy children playing. Katerina is a self-taught artist. Many of her pieces have been transformed into cards and calendars for UNICEF and for the Lung Association. Katerina, tell us about your journey and who inspired you. Well, first, thank you for inviting me. 
I am very honored and touched. And thank you for showing my artwork. It means a lot to me. And uh, that just set off the day wonderfully today. <clears throat> Zoom was very difficult. So what inspired me to be an artist? I've always wanted to be an artist. As a young child, even when I was growing up in Greece, I was born in Greece and we emigrated to Canada, like most, I guess, uh, Greek Americans, Greek Canadians and other Greeks. We came here to Montreal and Ottawa. And um, since I was little, I kept diaries all, uh, most of my life. And one of my dreams was to be an artist. And I don't like that word dream, but that is something that I wish for. And I, no matter what, I wanted to accomplish it. Now, my father was a very Greek, is still alive, he's 90, very healthy, very stern Greek man. And his wish was for his two children, myself, I'm the eldest, uh, my brother, Harry, uh, Petrinos lives in Washington, DC. And his wish was for us to be successful school, which is amazing because he was hard in school. And that was his dream. So when he would hear art, it did not impress him, nor did he push me or help me with it at all. So then he said, well, if you're not going to university, maybe, you know, get married, do the Greek thing. And I met my husband, Dimitri, who was wonderful when I was uh, 16 and a half. And we got married when I was 17 and a half. So I started um, being married very young and I was a weekend artist. We had children right away. So I have Lucia, who's now 44, and Gina, who's 38, my youngest daughter. So I would paint between their schooling and weekends. So, like I said, this was uh, something that I wanted to do. And I have this diary where I kept on saying, I want to be an artist. That's all I would say is just, I want to be an artist. So I would always draw and paint. Then I became a medical secretary because I like the medical field a lot and I understand it. When I was a medical secretary, I would bring in paintings and show them to the nurses, the doctors, and they were buying them. So that was my way into it. And then in 1990, um, I have a very, she passed away, Libby Mintoulis, a Greek uh, lady who was a teacher and an artist, and she loved my art. She, um, and she would buy my paintings. She would actually give me a blank check and she would say, just write anything you want. And I never valued my art as important. I would write the stupidest number, like $75. And then she unfortunately got breast cancer and invited me to her house. And she said, she was very ill. And she said, Katerina, I can't buy any more art. I want you with your portfolio now to go to the first gallery that you see. It's downtown Ottawa. And only when she pushed me, I went into the gallery. This was in 1990. There was no internet then. And I knocked on the door and said, hi, I'd like to show you some paintings. Now, this is the exact story as I'm, I have the paintings there and I'm kneel, kneeling down, showing my art and there's some kids walking in the woods. He liked it and a man walked in and he was from British Columbia and he, had, he was here on a conference. And he just said, without knowing what I was or who I was, he just said, oh, how much is that painting? The gallery man just said, oh, $300. And that is exactly how my art career began. There was nothing else to it. I sold my first painting. I was elated. I came home. I had my studio always at home in the basement and I just started just working. And, and that is how the beginning of my career, that was it. Then I went, then you get a little courage. Then I went to another gallery in Montreal. They loved my work. How lucky was I? I mean, really. And they kept on saying, we'll do bigger, do more. We did our first show, sold out 80 pieces. So that is how my career began. And then my dad said to me, didn't I tell you you were going to be a good artist? And I said, dad, you never wanted me to be an artist, but that's okay, you know? So that is how it happened. And um, that's just basically it, how I started. Well, that's wonderful. And I see that you're encouraging uh, your granddaughter to do some painting and you've been doing some uh, wonderful things to help people move along in the art, in the art field. So um, you've had some memorable encounters over your career. Can you share one with us? Well, in 1993, I was Ottawa's first UNICEF artist to be featured internationally and on the cover of the brochure. And I, I must say that was one of my other happiest days when they wanted to put me on the cover of the brochure and it sold out and they made so much money for UNICEF. So that was great. And with that came a lot of, a lot of uh, national uh, recognition for me as well, which just increased sales because I I am trying to sell my art as well. So that, that was great for me, the UNICEF and raising funds. So at the beginning, this is how my art is about me, my work, and then raising funds became very important. 
for me to become kind of like benevolent. So some people just have money and they can put 200,000 to something. I do it through the paintings. Um, uh, let me just give you a small example. A few years ago, we had a shooting here in Ottawa where a man, mm -hmm. a corporal was shot downtown Ottawa at the war memorial. And immediately my brain just thinks like that. I grabbed a, uh, a canvas and painted him and being saluted by his son, I heard he had a little boy and I'm really um, touched by children and I hate to think that any child is an orphan. When I painted this piece, my daughters loved it and immediately they sent it to the Ottawa Citizen, which is our local newspaper in Ottawa. And they loved it. They ran stories on it, they covered. And then we started with my gallery and the mayor of Ottawa, City Hall to make prints of this. So we raised $75,000 for the little boy who was now orphaned. I don't know where the mom is. He was being raised by his grandmother and father. So that was very good for Ottawa and for Canada. That was great. And I felt good. Uh, everybody won in the situation. I get some recognition and this little boy got something. Now, my youngest daughter, Gina, uh, got breast cancer uh, four years ago this week, actually. So with her after everything, and she's a very, very strong girl, she decided to give back because they gave her good treatment. And she said, mom, we're going to do art calendars. Take your art, we're going to sell the calendars. So we sell them in the States, Canada, and the hospital sells them as well. So we have raised about $40,000 that we give for clinical research. And now with the pandemic, we know what clinical trials are and they're very important. So they're actually naming a trial after. So things like that. And then my other daughter wrote a book on the pandemic and I illustrated that. So my art has sort of taken... Always my focus is selling art, painting every day, because I do paint, I'm very prolific. And then at the same time to have this little charitable component, which I find very rewarding for me. And then meeting people I met uh, through art, again, I was with UNICEF, Muscuri, Julio Iglesias, Princess Diana came and opened the wing in Ottawa. They presented it with one of my paintings. And I said, all I want is at least to you know, meet her and present it to her, and I did. So it's been a great, uh, a road like that and then just I'm happy to meet everybody that likes my artwork I'm very touched with each sale with each person that gives me a compliment and it just it's very very rewarding as an artist well wonderful thank you very much Katerina and I I certainly have enjoyed your artwork in my home and you had visited our chapter here a few years ago and I know yes. other sisters are also enjoying that so yes. um I thank you very much Eleni Kalinos enchanted us last December when our European liaison, Afanasia Vasiliadu, had an idea to bring sisters together to sing the Kalenda, the Greek Christmas carols. What a treat that was to have her sing for us and with us. Although I must say our voices were quite soft. She has captured the admiration of critic and audiences for the beauty of her voice in her many operatic performances. Eleni, could you share your journey with us and who inspired you? <laughs> Thank you for having me here. Um, my journey started in Thessaloniki, where I was born and raised. Um, my parents were uh, not uh, of musical background. They, they were not artists themselves. They came from middle class. My ancestors came from um, um, Asia Minor, Zmirni, Kekapadokia. Uh, so um, food was a lot in our, and cooking was a lot in our tra tradition, <laughs> since we talked about um, uh, food, and so was music. Um, not so much classical music, um, however, my, my parents, because they were uh, deprived of uh, a higher education themselves, they uh, valued education for us, me and my sister, and um, she's younger than me, and we are both in the arts, I'm an opera singer, she's an actress. Um, we both started with music. Uh, after having explored other things like gymnastics or foreign languages or to, to find what was a good fit for us um, or uh, calling. Uh, but um, the common element, I guess, was performing. Um, so I started from a very early age. I was uh, seven when I started studying and I keep studying until um, today. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, something happened. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, uh, 
so I, I started studying the cello in the conservatory in, um, in Thessaloniki. And I was particularly lucky, I guess, because I, that private conservatory was um, founded by a visionary uh, um, man who was half Austrian, is half Austrian, half Greek, um, but uh, tried to establish um, things that never happened in, in Greece. Um, um, more particularly, it was an orchestra and it was very important for my upbringing and um, other children's up upbringing um, because it was basically our point of reference it, uh, for many, many years. Uh, children's orchestras that traveled all over Europe. We did exchange programs and that was um, almost um, unreal when I was growing up. Um, and uh, that taught me a lot uh, about life also. And, um, and let me realize that it, music itself was the element that was inspiring for me, the, the composer's genius, uh, the uh, later the authors uh, through literature, uh, theater, uh, it was all an inspiration and, and music was a tool for me to discover myself and um, I guess um, become a better person, become a, um, a better performer and, and um, uh, share whatever I have to share as a, as a gift. Um, so after I completed the studies in the conservatory, um, I was a member of the Municipal Symphony Orchestra in Thessaloniki, and I started experimenting with, with singing. Um, I've always sang as a child in the choir, but never thought of a career as a singer. And so Greek singing came into my life. Um, I formed a, a band in Thessaloniki, but opportunity was limited there. And anybody who, who wanted to do something had to move to Athens. And so I did. And um, um, I took my first, I guess, leap of faith uh, this way, slightly changing career. I, I've always done music, but from being a, a cellist, I started being a, um, a singer, performer always playing cello, but Greek music. And there were six full years in Athens performing in music scenes, traveling abroad and within Greece and recording in studios, TV shows, radio shows, a lot of activity. And um, I was kind of unsuspected. Um, I started taking voice lessons just to protect my voice since I, I saw a lot of esteemed and well-known Greek singers losing um, part of their vocal ability, having vocal troubles and all that. And I said, I always, um, I get bored if there's no challenge for me. I need to do something that always challenges me. Mm -hmm. And um, I just decided to take um, um, voice lessons. And um, I saw the, the potential immediately for for opera, um, but without really knowing what opera was, it, it was an unknown world. Um, and um, all of a sudden, uh, I made a, a turn and uh, decided to that I was not fulfilled with what I was doing, even though I loved singing and, and Greek music. And I decided without knowing anyone or even where I was going to stay, uh, now I, I go back and, and I think, how, how the hell did I do it <laughs> going to America without knowing anyone? And just, I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to start. I'm going to find a school. I'm going to find work. And I'm going to support myself and, and start pursuing it. And so I did. Um, I'm still friends with the man who lent me his couch in Boston <laughs> when I landed. <laughs> Uh, through the Greek uh, community, uh, and I studied, I, I got my master's at Queens College uh, in New York, and then I got a scholarship uh, through the opera, from the Opera Institute in, at Boston University, 
Um, and slowly uh, started my career building up really patiently. In a way, it, there was momentum and um, I built uh, uh, a lot in a very uh, concise, concise yes. way. Uh, um, many, many roles, but always a lot of work all this time. Um, and so that's how it started in a way. And I remained in the States. It's my second country. I have lived in the States for 18 years. And now due to coronavirus, I'm back in Greece, hoping to be able to travel back and forth when everything settles. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, that, that is basically my, my story. Uh, now the career, of course, is more international. I, I started singing in, um, in uh, some European countries and in the impressive thing is it, it took me a while to sing in Greece because we all know how things are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So well, you, I, yes, go, go ahead. No, no. But, I was going to say you took a very circuitous route to get to your passion, which is obviously it, it shows on you that you love what you do. Um, and the thing that I love about the arts is that it does use all of the senses. That's what's beautiful about the arts. Um, if you have a most re rewarding role as an opera singer, which would it have been? Uh, rewarding, I, I don't know. I I have a, a weak uh, weakness, soft spot for Madame Butterfly, which mm -hmm. is <laughs> yes. Puccini is my favorite composer, uh, and I've performed it a lot. Uh, I perf I perform most of his roles, but um, it's it's very demanding. It's a marathon. She's all the time on, on stage. And uh, it is also about a woman who seems uh, petite and, and, and weak and all that, but she's extremely- um, um, Strong and mighty. Strong, <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well, and uh, we also have a connection because my mother was born in Asia Minor and oh. in Trigia. So a right close area. So um, thank you very, very much. I'm well, sure that our, our guests will have some questions at the end. Um, Marina von Vakas. I first met Marina in Stuttgart in 2019 during the European Conference for the Daughters of Penelope. In Brussels last year, I had the distinct pleasure to see firsthand Marina's art, her sculptures, and am the proud owner of one of her books. Marina took every opportunity to learn and perfect her talents. Marina, pes mas tin historia sas, ke piose en epafse. Prote fa sa se feristiso, e feristo tin ipa ti proedro tis organosis, tin agatimeni muselia, ya tin brosklisi e pano sa foto panel, e to fioromeno sti gneka το είπα το συμβούλιο και την εκτελεστική γραμμα... διαφήντρια αδελφή Έλενα Σαβιολάκη. Θα σας μιλήσω για τη ζωή μου. Η ζωή μου μοιάζει με ένα τριαντάφυλλο που άνοιξε, ξεδίπλωσα τα χρώματα και τα αρώματά του. Η γλυκιά γεύση που αναδύεται από τα πολύχρωμα πουντρέ, ροδοπέταλά του, συμβολίζει την αγάπη των γονιών μου του ανδρός μου, της οικογένειάς μου και των αφοσιωμένων φίλων μου. Από πολύ μικρή διέκρινε το ταλέντο η μητέρα μου, το ταλέντο που είχα το διέκρινε πρώτη μητέρα μου. Στη ζωγραφική ε, και σε κάθε είδους χειροτεχνία και διακοσμητική τέχνη. Οι γονείς μου είναι μικρασιάτες από την Καπαδοκία και την Κωνσταντινούπολη. Ήρθαν το 1924 στην Ελλάδα σαν πρόσφυγες Έχω και αφιερωμένα όλα μου τα βιβλία σε εκείνη την ιστορία, την ε, τραγική ιστορία όλων αυτών των ε, οικογενειών. Κάθε φορά που ζωγράφιζα, ένιωθα πολύ μεγάλη συγκίνηση όταν έπαιρνα ένα λευκό χαρτί και ζωγραφίζοντάς το, το μετέτρεπα σε εικόνες που είχαν χρώματα, που τα χρώματά τους έλαμπαν. Στα σχολικά μου χρόνια, η καθηγήτρια των τεχνικών με είχε εξουσιοδοτήσει να, να επιλέγω τα θέματα διδασκαλίας της της τάξης, 
ε, τι οποίε παρέει δεν το μάθημα των τεχνικών κάθε φορά. Και πολλέ φορέ, όταν προετοίμαζα εκθέσει ζωγραφική, ε, με καλούσαν να τη βοηθήσω στο ατελέτη. Πήγαινα με μεγάλη χαρά. Εκεί πήρα τα πρώτα καθοριστικά μαθήματα ζωγραφική από την πρώτη μου καθηγήτρια. Ε, ακολούθησα οι σπουδέ μου στην ιστορία της τέχνης Σορβόνη. Εκεί έκανα Argotic και Argomen στην Ακαδημία Ζωγραφικής του Βελγίου και στην Ακαδημία Γλυπτικής στο Βέλγιο, καθώς επίσης μαθήτευσα και δίπλα σε ένα μεγάλο φλαμανδό γλύπτη. Πραγματοποίησα πολλές εκθέσεις σε πολλές ευρωπαϊκές χώρες και στην Ελλάδα ε, και η γνώση όμως, η γνώση με την με ευαισθητοποίησε και μέσα από άπειρες προκλήσεις ε, των οικαστικών κινημάτων που διαπέρασαν τον αιώνα, τους αιώνες και τον τελευταίο, κυρίως τον 20ο αιώνα, ε, διεύρυναν τους καλλιτεχνικούς μου ορίζοντες. Διεύρυναν τις επιλογές μου στο είδος ζωγραφικής, τη ματιέρα, τη ματιέρα και την ενότητα των θεμάτων που επιθυμούσα να ζωγραφίσω. Είχα εμπιστοσύνη στις ικανότητές μου, διότι είμαι πολύ αυστηρή με τον εαυτό μου. Πήρα μέρος σε διεθνείς μπενάλες στη Ρώμη και σε άλλους διαγωνισμούς και τους κέρδισα. Οι Ιταλοί με τίμησαν με τον τίτλο της «Αρτίστα Δικιάρα Φάμα». Φημισμένη καλλιτέχνης. Είναι ένας τίτλος ο οποίος με κατοχύρωσε καλλιτεχνικά στην Ιταλία. Τώρα, στο σχολείο, η φιλόλογος καθηγήτρια των ελληνικών θαύμαζε τον γραπτό μου λόγο. Έμενε πάντα κατάπληκτη από τις εκθέσεις που έγραφα και μου είπε «Εσύ πρέπει να γίνεις συγγραφέας». Απόρρισα τότε. Για μένα συγγραφέα σήμαινε ένας πολύ σοφός άνθρωπος. Δεν σταμάτησα όμως να γράφω μικρά διηγήματα και ποίηματα. Έγραψα δύο βιβλία που εκδόθηκαν από τις εκδόσεις Λιβάνης και πολύ γρήγορα, μα πάρα πολύ γρήγορα, έγιναν best sellers. Τώρα γράφω το τρίτο μου βιβλίο. Έκανα παρουσιάσεις στο βιβλίο μου στις Βρυξέλλες, στην Ελλάδα σε πολλές πόλεις, έκανα πάρα πολλές ε, εκπομπές στο ραδιόφωνο, στην τηλεόραση, ε, στα τοπικ, στους τοπικούς ραδιοφωνικούς σταθμούς, ε, στα διάφορα κανάλια της ΣΕΡΤ, και στη Λάρισα, ε, ο Σύνδεσμος Γραμμάτων και Τεχνών Θεσσαλίας με τίμησε με τη, για την συγγραφική αξία, την καλλιτεχνική οντότητα και προσφορά μου στον πολιτισμό. Πάντα όμως, επιθυμούσα να κάνω πολλά πράγματα μαζί. Από μικρή μου πολύ επικοινωνιακή με τους άλλους ανθρώπους, μεγαλύτερους ή μικρότερους στην ηλικία. Από 5 έως 18 χρονών υπηρέτησα στο Σώμα Ελληνίδων Οδηγών Προσκόπων. Ε, ήμουν υπεύθυνη πάντα για τα καλλιτεχνικά θέματα και έφτασα μέχρι τον βαθμό της αρχηγού. Προσκλήθηκα με τιμητική, θα έλεγα, πρόσκληση, γιατί είμαστε έξι, κυρί, έξι κοπέλες τότε, πολύ νεαρές, στη Λάρισα, από τον Ελληνικό Ερυθρό Σταυρό, και ύστερα από μια σειρά εντατικών μαθημάτων, υπηρέτησα σαν εθελόντρια νοσοκόμα στο στρατιωτικό και το πολιτικό νοσοκομείο της Λάρισας για δύο-τρεις μήνες. Στις Βρυξέλλες, τις οποίες διαμένουμε με τον σύζυγό μου επί 38 χρόνια, υπήρξε ιδρυτικό μέλος και στέλεχο σε πολλές φιλανθρωπικές πολιτιστικές περιβαλλοντικές οργανώσεις και ιδρύματα, όπως οι γυναίκε τη Ευρώπη, το Λύκειο των Ελληνίδων, ο κύκλο, στο WWF, καθώ και είμαι και ιδρυτικό μέλο και πρώτη πρόεδρο των Daughters of Penelope, chapter 439, θέτη. Στην Ελλάδα ήμουν και είμαι στι οργανώσει Ελπίδα, Γυναίκε Χωρί Σύνορα, Παναθηναϊκή και Πάνο και Χρυσίδα for Life. Είμαι φίλος διαφόρων ευρωπαϊκών και αμερικανικών μουσείων, επίσης του Metropolitan Museum της Νέας Υόρκης και της όπερας La Monnaie των Βρυξελών. Ύστερα από πρόταση και πίεση βέλγων πολιτικών, ασχολήθηκα με την πολιτική επί 18 συνεχή χρόνια.
Στο Δήμο του, Βολ... του Βολιβέ Σεν Πιέρ, που είναι ένας από τους 19 Δήμους των Βρυξελών, εκλέχτηκα Δημοτική Σύμβουλος, η πρώτη μη Βελγίδα Δημοτική Σύμβουλος, στα 150 χρόνια ζωής και ιστορίας του Δήμου μας. Επίσης, διετέλεσε ως πρόεδρος, αντιπρόεδρος, διευθύνουσα σύμβουλος, μέλος διοικητικών συμβουλίων και εταιριών του Δήμου σχετικά με τα πολιτιστικά και τα ευρωπαϊκά θέματα. Και σήμερα είμαι διευθύνουσα σύμβουλος στην εταιρεία του Δήμου για τα ευρωπαϊκά θέματα. Σας ευχαριστώ που με ακούσατε. Ευχαριστώ, Μαρίνα. Ποιος είναι έσπυρη. Ποιος μου έδωσε την έμπνευση. Ε, α, ε, ε, την έμπνευση μου την έδωσε ο αγαπημένος μου σύντροφος, ο αγαπημένος μου άνδρας Κωσής Βαμβακάς, υδροβιολόγος, ωκεανολόγος, ε, πρώην ανώτερος τέλεχος της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής και καθηγητής στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Γάνδης ε, και άρχοντας του Οικουμενικού Πατριαρχείου Κωνσταντινού Πόλεως. Αυτός με κρατάει πάντα ε, με, με προτρέπει, με, βεβαίως με, ε, μου δίνει, είναι ο πυλώνας και το στήριγμά μου στην διαδρομή μου. Όλα όσα πραγματοποίησα έγιναν με τη δική του βοήθεια, προτροπή, συμπαράσταση, γενοδορία και προστασία του. Είναι η έμπνευσή μου, η πηξίδα μου, ο αυστηρός κριτής μου και η ψυχική μου ισορροπία. Ευχαριστώ, Marina. Um, Elena will do a little bit of translating for us to share Marina's story in English. Sisters, I will try my best. Uh, Sister Marina says it so beautifully in uh, Greek, um, but we will try our best to translate it in English for our members who are English speakers only. My dear sisters, I would like to thank you as it is an honor to have been invited to participate on the panel for International Women's Day. Special thanks to the Grand President and Vera Celia Kazmarski, the Grand Lodge and Executive Director Elena Sabiolecki. My life is similar to a rose that bloomed releasing its colors and aromas. The sweetness of its petals symbolize the love I have received from my parents, my husband, my family, and my loyal friends. From a young age, my mother realized my talent in drawing arts and crafts in Art Deco. I felt great satisfaction and joy when I transformed blank paper into vibrant colors full of life. In my school years, my art teacher let me act as a consultant, allowing me to pick the subjects that taught us in class, and she would also invite me to help her prepare her art exhibits. It was my art teacher that gave me my first real art classes. In the coming years, I studied history of art in Sorbonne, also at the Drawing Academy and Sculpting Academy in Brussels. I trained near a great Belgian sculptor and had the honor to exhibit my art in many galleries around multiple major European cities. Motivated through knowledge and numerous challenges originating from visual art movements, I broadened my artistic horizons, my choices of art, my material, and my subject matters. I have always believed in myself because I constantly judge my work and find ways to improve it. I participated in the International Biennale and other competitions in Rome and came on top. The Italians honored me with the title Artista di Chiara Fama, meaning famous artist, which established me as an artist in Italy. I have always been eager to do many things together at the same time. In school, my writing and philosophy teacher admire my written language skills. She was always amazed by my essays and told me, one day, Marina, you should become an author. I was flabbergasted. For me back then, author was synonymous to wise person. I have always been very social, even at a very young age. From the age of five until the age of 18, I served the Greek Girl, Scout, Girl Scouts, and my responsibility there, of course, was arts and crafts. I was invited by the Greek Red Cross and completed an intensive course to become a volunteer nurse, primarily due to my great will to serve the community. In Brussels, my home for the past 38 years, I have been either the founder or a member in many nonprofit charitable organizations and community centers, like the Lyceum of Greek Women, the Women of Europe, and the Circle. 
I was also the founder and first chapter president of the Daughters of Penelope Sentence chapter number 430, 439. Sorry. Following the calling from Belgian politicians, I got involved with politics and have been involved for 18 years. In the municipality of Walloway Saint Pierre of Brussels, I was the first elected non native Belgian civil municipality councillor in its 150 year history. I have also served as president, vice president, CEO, and counselor in many of the municipalities' companies that do work around cultural and European matters. When asked who inspired Marina to cultivate her talent and excel in her industry, she answered, my husband. My husband inspires me every day. He, from the very beginning, believed in my talents and supported me throughout my journey. He encourages me to push harder and to express myself through my art. My husband and I met at a very young age. He is my biggest fan and my greatest supporter. Everything I have achieved was made possible thanks to his help, motivation, company, generosity, and protection. He is my inspiration, my compass, my critic, and my emotional equalizer. We have traveled around the world three times together, visiting museums and art galleries, comparing civilizations and their cultural journeys through their visual art. Political challenges, demographic alterations, refugees, together with which religion and tradition travel, domination wars and religious extremists do affect me and have my deepest attention. Historical expressionism character characterizes my art, which talks about cultural and civil clashes. Authoring my historical best-selling novels, I do a lot of research so as to state the facts and figures of the era, above which I build my fictional stories. Last but not least, my source of energy to keep creating and traveling beyond my borders comes from the touching feedback I receive by my audience, my editors, art critics, and popularity of my work. I have to admit, though, that when I paint or write, I do it for me, for the joy I get out of making something new. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, those are such amazing sisters, and we want to thank you for sharing them with us. Uh, Marina, kataplitiki historia su. Ke ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ που έχετε μοιραστεί την ιστορία σου μαζί μας. So, our guests, um, it has been a wonderful opportunity to hear your story. And I wonder, uh, Diane, what advice could you offer to someone who is looking to follow in your footsteps? You're muted. The most cliche advice, which is just don't give up. <laughs> uh, you know, every door that you knock on that doesn't open, there's always another one that will. Um, take no prisoners, don't be afraid of anything, just be careful. Uh, that was advice from a really strong woman in my life, my, an aunt of mine. And stay true to yourself. Very, very good advice. Very, very good advice. Um, Katarina, what advice would you give to a budding artist? And you are muted. Elena, can you unmute Katarina? Okay. There. Perfect. Why is what I give to a budding artist? Well, number one, I believe, um, when I said before, uh, I don't believe just in dreams. I think that most people have to have a certain love and a talent for something. To just blindly say, I want to do this or I want to be this without uh, comprehending what you're saying is futile. So if you really do have a love and a passion for the arts or anything in your life, that's what I tell students when I go to schools to give talks, if you're really good at something or you want to nurture it and you, you believe that you have a talent, uh, although it's, it's viewed by many people differently, but you know if you have a certain talent, uh, I would say, yes, of course, go for it. I just don't like to say that thing about dreams where I can blindly say I want to be an astronaut when I don't have the qualification. So I tell my granddaughters and my grandchildren, if they're interested in something, yes, you pursue it. And it's good to have and to taste everything when you're young, of course. So that's how I would start for the young people. For the elder people, it's very difficult for the middle beginning stages of an artist, especially now because of the internet. 
there's a lot of competition. Uh, there's a lot, it, it's a little more difficult now. And the galleries now as an artist is, I still believe in galleries and I am in many galleries and I appreciate that, but they're not becoming obsolete and I hope they never do because I love the gallery space. I love the shows. I love meeting the people. Uh, I just think it's more difficult now to sort of become an artist. And I found being in a gallery and accepted by other people like that uh, to be validating. So anybody can just go on the internet and say, I'm an artist here, buy my painting. And you might sell something, but I do like how there is a tradition and it continues like this. And I just want galleries to stay. And I always encourage people to support the arts through galleries and to visit galleries and support the artists. We take my grandchildren all the time to the uh, National Gallery. They come to almost all of my exhibitions and this is how you nurture them. So my granddaughters are very, very artistic, but they're also talented in sports and, and, and academically. So we'll see where they go, but I love teaching art. That's another thing I didn't talk about. I'm not a teacher. So if I am invited to teach someone or at my gallery, we'll have an art lesson. It's basically paint like Katarina Martitas. And when I'm self-taught, <laughs> I've read a lot of books. I do not have a degree in art and I don't think you need a degree in art to paint something that you love as long as you have a theory. And a lot of people said that if, if my art was based on 100% um, perspective or this or that, I would never probably be as successful as I was. So I do say, you have a talent, yes, go for it, but you gotta be prepared to be disciplined, work hard because it's difficult, it's competitive and I'm very disciplined. And I, I'm very strong and you have to be able to take no sometimes and critique and work on it. So when I do a painting, sometimes if I'm not too sure, I go to my critics, which is my husband, my children and my grandkids. And they're very honest and I'll take honest criticism. So you have to be really strong to be even in the arts. Thank you. And I think that most successful people start off in one direction and then maybe carry on in another. It is just... Um, you know, it, it opens up the doors to other kinds of things. You know, I was an educator for 30 years, but, you know, there was more to that than just being in a classroom. There was other things that encompassed that or, you know, turned me to another direction. Um, and so I think that everybody has to be open to the possibilities that their chosen career can lead them. So thank you. Um, Eleni, what advice could you give to someone that is uh, looking towards a musical career? First of all, to make sure that they have the talent and then perseverance and patience. It takes a very, very long time um, to, to hone your, your skills. Um, but it's not only about that, it, it's about communicating. So we also have to take care, not only of the technical part, uh, aspect of what we do, but also of our soul, knowing yourself, getting stronger, uh, because you're going to um, uh, encounter a lot of um, obstacles. And, and this way, by knowing yourself, you can know and understand other people, learn to listen, learn to connect, learn to communicate, because it's not, an, an artist is not just a machine executing but it's a, it's a human being. So uh, at the same time, while you hone your, your skills, um, try to be a better human and, and convey that through what you do. And that's the, the essence of what we do, just touching each other with our art and talent. Absolutely. I have a goddaughter who decided that being a percussionist was her chosen way in the musical field which of course as you know most orchestras don't need a lot of percussionists and so she have she has found you know different vehicles she's worked with some different groups and I have told her that you know straight percussion is a bit obtuse to the ear you know so so I, I've had to hone my skills to be able to enjoy her con her percussion uh, concert. So, um, yes, I think you have to be open to many, many different opportunities. So, well, talking about percussion and, and strong women, uh, I think her name is Evelyn Glennie. OK, she uh, she grew up and uh, started uh, developing ear loss. And so she learned how to perform with an orchestra with no uh, hearing, basically, wow. um, just by feeling I feel. the vibrations. Yes, yes. I think I read about her. 
Yes, that's amazing. So, it is amazing. <laughs> Another example. Yes, thank you. Um, Marina Mas. Marisa. Do you want to ask the question in Greek? Um, Elena, would that be easier? It's okay. Yes. Αλλά είπε περισσότερα από αυτά που εγώ είπα. Βεβαίω, θέλετε να τα συμπληρώσω. Τι με πνέει ακόμα, αλλά νομίζω ότι θα προχωρήσω στην καινούργια ερώτηση, την οποία θα μου κάνετε. Περιμένω την καινούργια ερώτησή σα. Well, we, so we want to know how you would help somebody who wanted to also be an artist or a sculptor or an author. Λοιπόν, εγώ θα, αν ξαναγύριζα στην παιδική μου ηλικία, θα συμβούλευα τη μικρή Μαρίνα. Πρώτον, να ανακαλύψει τα ταλέντα και τις κλίσεις της. Δεύτερον, να επιλέξει ή να βάλει προτεραιότητες σε κάθε ένα από αυτά τα ταλέντα ή τις κλίσεις. Τρίτον, να βρει τις δυνατότητες να τα αξιοποιήσει δυναμικά. Να κάνει τις κατάλληλες σπουδέ που θα απαιτούνται προκειμένου τα ταλέντα αυτά να περιβληθούν από επιστημονική γνώση και διπλώματα. Να έχει τη δύναμη και το ασθένος, να υπερασπίζεται τα δικαιώματά της να εμπιστεύεται το ένστικτό της, να διαχειρίζεται με σύνεση τη χαρά και τη λύπη της, να μην παραδίδεται σε υποσχέσεις, αλλά να μετράει τις δικές της ικανότητες. Και τέλος, να μην ξεχνά τη δυστυχία του κόσμου, διότι η φιλανθρωπία δίνει τροφή στην ψυχή και ικανοποίηση στην ανθρώπινη συνείδηση. Thank you, Marina. Ευχαριστώ. Έλενα, you're up. So Marina said, you know, when it comes to giving advice to her younger self or to someone else, you know, that wants to follow, you know, what she did, if she could go back to her childhood and meet her younger self, she would tell little Marina to discover all her talents and abilities, to incorporate them in her life and take advantage of them, to choose and set priorities between them to focus her studies around those talents and support them with science and many diplomas. And of course, to not forget or neglect people in need because charitable contributions nourish, nourish the soul and satisfies human conscience. Very beautifully said. Thank you very much, Marina. And thank you, Elena, for translating for us. Um, this has been an amazing opportunity we do have a couple of questions. I noticed that most of our attendees, or I just discovered that most of our attendees were putting their comments for the panelists. So I'm not quite sure that all the attendees saw the wonderful comments that, uh, that were being shown by our audience. That, uh, so we thank you for that. And uh, Mariantha, you have a question? I do, excuse me, I do have a question for Eleni. Eleni, the question is, do you mentor the young, such as aspiring recent college graduates who majored in performance? Yes, I definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, started, performance never gave me enough time to, and, and traveling to, to teach. So uh, Corona is another opportunity for me. I, I turn it around and I love teaching as well. It's not my first love, but uh, teaching and mentoring, yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. How can someone get in touch with you if they want your mentoring? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> we'll let them get in, in touch with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eleni. And uh, Georgette, you have a question. Yes, um, to all of the panelists, um, first of all, Diane, what is your favorite dish? What is my favorite dish? <laughs> That's like asking me which child I love more. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have one. I have many. I, I figured you'd say that, but, <laughs> uh, you, but they can follow you on Facebook because you highlight a lot of your favorite dishes um, and share the recipes on Facebook, don't they, if they follow you? I mean, I, I do focus a lot on plant-based food because I think um, that's one of the incredible uh, riches of Greek cuisine we have uh, and, and that's very timely right now too as we 
we've all come face to face with how what we put into our bodies affects our immunity and our health and our overall well-being. And I think last year has really driven that message home for many people, uh, especially since one of the you know main underlying health uh, issues with people who suffer the worst of COVID is obesity. So in the Mediterranean diet and the Greek diet are, are very well positioned. And we have, you know, as we all know, we have an incredible array of amazing plant-based dishes. So I try to focus on that, but, and I, you know, and I, I, I really like to teach people that plant-based food is very satisfying. Yes. Um, so I guess overall, I would go for the vegetables. I, I think that should be the GNTO's next slogan to, to Greece, like come to Greece and eat your vegetables. I think it should be, <laughs> people would actually come to Greece to eat great produce. Which, which is a great prelude to Lent, right? Um, yeah, it's a great preview to Lent. Uh, Katerina, what is your, your favorite cleaning, the cleaning that's for Katerina? Are you frozen? You're frozen a little bit. Yeah, I didn't hear the full question, sorry. Katerina, what is your favorite painting or the painting that's closest to your heart? Oh, wow, there, that's a hard one. Again, I can tell you my favorite dishes, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I love Gemista. And um, so my favorite painting, I, I'm known for my winter paintings the most, and then I would say my rain uh, pieces. Now in my own home, I have kept the same paintings actually for the last at least 10 years. And if my kids, when they were younger, liked one, that painting will stay on my wall. I will not sell it. Uh, very few, like I have about uh, 15, 20 of my paintings in the house. I do rotate a few, but I do love my winter pieces and I love moody paintings. So for instance, summer is beautiful to paint and I do paint summer pieces because I'm trying to sell part of art too. But uh, I like uh, like a good thunderstorm and a nice snowstorm. I like that that moody feeling. So I do love um, painting maybe with a darker sky and 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 the kids being safe and loved and around it. So I, I that's where I go towards. And everything that's in my house is definitely a favorite, or it was one of my kids' favorites. Wonderful, thank you. I think I saw one of those in Celia's house. Um, yes, one she's she's a very good collector. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, Eleni, your favorite musical piece. I know you said something about Madame Butterfly, but what is your favorite musical piece? Uh, I don't know if I have a favorite. I, I love all kinds of music. Um, uh, at the top of my head, I guess uh, Dvorak's The New World Symphony, Ooh. I love a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, and I love a lot. Um, um, all stuffed vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, think, I think Diane, we're, I think Diane, we're all coming for dinner. Yeah, please do. <laughs> we're not, like, we can't do that right now. In <laughs> That's the problem. You can make a yemi stand with just the right. So I'm on the right way. I'm on the right way. Plan, um, <laughs> right there. Marina, your My favorite, your favorite art piece, uh, of your sculptures and your and your paintings, what do you hold closest to your heart? Translate, Elena. Translate. <laughs> Όταν είμαι μπροστά σε ένα καβαλέτο, στο καβαλέτο μου και έχω ένα ταμπλό που ζωγραφίζω, εγώ γίνομαι καβαλέτο και το καβαλέτο γίνεται μαρίνα. Κάνουμε μία, έχουμε μία σχέση φοβερή μεταξύ μας. Μπορώ να ζωγραφίζω 12 ώρες συνεχής. Δεν κουράζομαι γιατί γίνομαι αυτό που απεικονίζω και αυτό που απεικονίζεται έρχεται μέσα μου. Είναι φοβερή σχέση. Δεν μπορώ να ξεχωρίσω. Όταν κάνω γλυπτική, Δημιουργώ κάτι τρισδιάστατο. Το βλέπω από όλε τι όψει. Κάθε όψη μοιάζει με ένα διαμάντι που φεύγει, φέγγει και λάμπει διαφορετικά. Κάθε όψη του την αγαπώ. 
στη γλυπτική είμαι πιο abstract, πιο αφ, αφαιρετική. Αλλά αγαπώ πολύ αυτή την αφαίρεση, γιατί μέσα από εκεί μπορείς να δώσεις δύναμη και να ξεπετάξει. Αγαπώ την τελευταία μου δημιουργία Deseo Pax, επιθυμώ την ειρήνη, γιατί συγκρίνω την εποχή μας με το μεσαίωνα. Ε, δεν ξέρω, κάθε εποχή και κάθε ενότητα ήταν κάτι που έφευγε από μένα και ξαναγυρνάει σε μένα. Δεν μπορώ να ξεχωρίσω. Είναι σαν να ξεχωρίζει μία μάνα τα παιδιά της. Ε, ε, δεν, δεν ξέρω ποιο είναι το καλύτερο ή το πιο αγαπημένο μου έργο. Αυτό που έπιασε το μάτι μου είναι αυτό που είναι, ήταν το χαματοκάμερα, το, τα κόκκινα λουλούδια που έκανες. Ναι, τα παστέλ. Αυτό, αυτό μου άρεσε Α, εμένα. Α, ε, αν μπορέσω θα σου στείλω ένα. Αυτά είναι η χαρά τη ζωή. Αυτά είναι μέσα από τα λουλούδια, βγαίνει μια ζωή. Αναδύεται ένα άρωμα. Αναδύεται κάτι διαφορετικό. Σου δίνει χαρά. Δίνει χαμόγελο μόλι το κοιτά. Αλλά αυτό είναι μια εποχή που πέρασε και τώρα κάνω πράγματα που με βάζουν περισσότερο στην πολιτική κατάσταση, στην κατάσταση του του αιώνα και αυτό που φέρνουμε σαν πολίτε μια κάποια εποχή. One final question. Um, <clears throat> they talk about the mentors in your, you've already talked about your mentors in your career and obviously you all are breaking that glass seal, that proverbial glass ceiling um, and making inroads in your respective areas. But um, when you do have struggles, what do you do to overcome them? How do you overcome your challenge? Um, and don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Diane? <laughs> Diane? I think I just, just plow ahead. D- just, just I, I don't know, stay steadfast and plow ahead and be a little bit strategic. But, you know, I'm also, personally, I... I've never been strategic in my life. I've always lived by the victim of man plans, God laughs. Maybe that's my Icarian serendipity. Um, But for me, I have a daughter, I have a son and a daughter. And my daughter's an artist actually, she's a a, a painter. And my son is thinking about studying um, acting. So no doctors in the family. <laughs> But I, for me, you know, having, having this, the burden of teaching other people who, you know, my own children, how to be good people is really about, that really helped me as well in terms of staying true to myself, because that's the, I think that's the greatest lesson you can give anyone is is just if you believe in what you're doing the universe will help you but you have to truly with an open heart believe and ask and work of course you have to work Work. (laughs) (laughs) like the old new york joke how do i they stop you on the street you would you would understand this and then you know so there's a guy with a cello on the street and he stops someone and says you know how Do you know how do I get to Carnegie Hall and somebody says practice, practice, practice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that hard work element is, is really important for us all to remember uh, just to persevere and to keep going, moving yeah, forward. Don't give up. Have a good That's group it. around you to keep pushing you forward when you don't have the energy to push yourself a little bit. I think that, that too, a good support group is important. Why I you need those strong, supportive women behind you. That's right. And we're lucky to have all of you as um, strong, supportive inspirations for all of us. And I think those are the questions we have from President Celia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgette. Um, Wow, an hour plus. It has truly been a remarkable afternoon. I can't thank you all enough for spending part of this extraordinary day of celebration with all of us. Thank you to our guests, Diane Cochillas, Caterina Merticas, Eleni Canelos and Marina Van Vacas for sharing their experiences, making us laugh and sharing with us the love of their craft.
it came out 100% this afternoon. Yeah. I will now turn the microphone over to our Grand Vice President, Kathy Bazookas, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Grand President Celia. I would just like to say that on behalf of the Grand Lodge and the Daughters of Penelope, I would like to thank our distinguished guests. International Women's Day is a very important day for women all over the world. It's a day to shine and we have had four stars today. Show us that anything can be accomplished if you believe in yourself and you follow your heart. I read a saying the other day that is perfect for today. She believed she could do it and she did. Thank you to Diane for sharing your stories of Greek cuisine. Eleni, for the beauty of your voice that melts the hearts of everyone who listens. Marina, for your imagination and creativity of books and sculpting. And Katerina, for bringing joy in all those who see your paintings. It was an honor to have all of you represent women of the world on this important day. These accomplished women also represent just a few of our sisters in the Daughters of Penelope who we represent. I would also like to thank Grand President Celia, Executive Director Elena, Grand Secretary Georgette, and Grand Treasurer Mariavi for helping make this day possible. And also to all of our sisters who joined us today, we thank you very much. If you have any questions or any, for any of our guests, you may reach out to them by visiting their websites which Elena posted for you all in the chat section. Also, you can find this webinar posted later on our Daughters of Penelope website, and you can watch it again if you would like, or use it in any way that you would like to present maybe to your chapters or your districts. This has been an absolute wonderful day. Here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, may we raise them. Thank you. We hope you had a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending where you are. And remember, let's keep moving forward. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.